I thought I would talk a little bit about how to interpret studies. Um, I'm going to try to keep this at 15 minutes or less, but I think these are some of my tips on how to interpret a study. And this is worth, it's good for multiple reasons. It's good because when you review a paper, you try to appraise a paper, this, some of these tips will be quite useful. But it's also to know a little bit into the mind of what editors think and what they're looking for. So when you're writing your paper, uh, you know uh, what you should be doing, what can constitute best practices. Um, um, so these are my disclosures. Probably some of you know, I was trained by Manny Menon. That's my connection to the Vaticuti Foundation. I was uh, trained by Manny Menon between 2010 and 12. And he introduced me to this gentleman on the bottom right, who is Prokar Dasgupta, and you probably all know. And uh, Prokar is the editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Urology International. And he asked me to join his team of associate editors in 2012. So I've been an associate editor of that journal for six years now. And I typically read over 10 plus papers a week uh, to decide if the paper should be sent for peer review and then manage, handle uh, the peer review process afterwards. So I have some experience in uh, going over papers and I hope to share some of that experience with you and what I see as an editor of what constitute a good paper versus a bad paper. And again, we cannot do this in 15 minutes, so I'm going to really focus on certain areas and you know, we can chat about basically every aspect of publishing otherwise uh, and this can go on for hours. Um, a little advertisement here is uh, I did guest edited an issue of urologic oncology on uh, observational studies. Um, so as part of this guidebook, if you want, there's a lot of really good papers in, well, obviously uh, I'm involved in them, but the uh, good papers on how to interpret studies, which database to use, what type of studies can be done, what studies are out there. Um, and the, data, the things that I'm presenting to you here are part of this article by my friend and longtime colleague Maxine Sun and Stu Lipsitz, who's a biostatistician at our institution. Sometimes when you read a scientific paper, it looks like this. It's just a big, complex, a lot of mathematical equations, imputation, propensity score matching, adjustment for confounder, this and that. And, you know, I'm going to try to tease out some of the details that are, I think, as an editor, important. But as you, as a writer, or you're trying to design your study, that you should also be on your radar. Because these are the things that editors pick up first when they read a paper to decide if it's a good paper or a bad paper. So uh, statistics is a science of variability because, as you know, there's variability in real life uh, between black and white race, between uh, robotic versus open surgery. Um, but you're, and you're trying to pick up on these patterns and understand, is something truly better or is it just some sort of uh, fluke? Um, and to try to understand the variability is the art of probability. That's the scientific way you assess vari variation. And by studying the probability, you can make inference and then try to establish some sort of, or think or hypothesize that there may be a causal relationship between, let's say, robotic prostatectomy and better erections or something like that. Um, so in short, basically you have a situation like on the right, you have patients that you did one procedure versus another, and then you do the mathematical probability analyses and then you try to infer what is really happening on the left side, which is the true, you know, what is going on in the population. We often talk in p-values, right? Because when we talk about statistics, it's all about p-value. And, and every journal club, everywhere we go, it's always about what's the p-value? Is it less than 0.05? Is it uh, less than 0.001? But I would tell you to exercise extreme caution because the p-value as you know, is an arbitrary decision that somebody decided that this is what is considered acceptable. Um, there's a viewpoint that was published in JAMA recently on the whole p-value debacle, and somebody said, well, maybe the p-value should be 0.005 instead of 0.05. Because the reality is that what we care about is not the p-value or what, you know, at least from a conceptual standpoint, it's more the confidence interval. So my first real message to everyone here is that when you present statistics or you read a paper, it's more about the confidence interval because you have to accept that the result you have can be anywhere along that confidence interval. I can also tell you that a lot of the major journals, and for example, I think uh, Journal of the National Cancer Institute is like that, they actually don't care about p-value. They don't want you even to report the p-value. They want you to report the confidence interval. So, Sometimes you see papers where you, they basically just report p-values and no confidence interval. And for me, that's a red flag. 
So again, emphasizing that the confidence interval matters much more for me than the p-value, for example. So like I said, if you don't report that confidence interval, that variability, I think that's a red flag, and that's one of the tips I could give you today. The other thing that uh, I think is obvious to many of you is that, uh, and I, we see this all the time, is to claim that there's no difference because the p-value is greater than 0.05. As you know, there's two possibilities to that. One is that your sample size, and you know, it's the alpha, beta value, but in short, it's either because your sample size is too small, and as a result, you were not able to demonstrate something that was significant, or on the other hand, the difference is really small, but it is potentially still important, meaning that you, know, you may have a difference, but that difference may not be detectable within the population you have, but still, it is something that is of value. Um, the other important concept, and especially as we move forward and we start doing a lot of big data analyses, Right now that we have machine-based learning, we're gonna be parsing through millions of records in your hospital, and now suddenly everything becomes statistically significant. This is also a big error, is that you report all sorts of things. You have one million patients, 500,000 patients, everything is statistically significant, you start talking about all this. But one thing that you also need to understand is what is statistically relevant and what is clinically different. Because you may have a 0.2% difference and that is of absolutely no clinical relevance, but it may still be statistically significant. Like for example here, just as an example, if you have a sample size of 25 and you have a 4% difference, it's gonna be statistically significant. But if your sample size is of 10,000, you, you will be powered enough to detect a 0.2% difference. And for most clinical scenarios, a 0.2% difference is absolutely of no use to us. So uh, we see this a lot in papers. People will overinterpret their findings. They're so happy that their p-value is significant, but then they don't even take a second to see that the difference is actually 2% and that it's absolutely of no use or no benefit to the patient. Um, the, uh, the other important thing that I would stress in terms of interpreting or writing papers is the slippery slope of cause, uh, causation. Correlation does not imply causation. Unless you're doing a randomized trial with 10,000 patients, multi-centric, and even then, you know, yesterday I talked about robotic versus open prostatectomy in that clinical trial, and I'm not even sure that we can in implicate causation in that situation for many reasons. Uh, it's really hard, right, if you're just doing a retrospective study to, do, to imply any specific causation. So when you write your paper, it is extremely important to talk about may association between a treatment and the endpoint, rather than just making a bold claim about robotic surgery leads to better pot, uh, potency or something like that. It would be much more appropriate to say, in this study, robotic surgery is associated with better rates of potency. Um, it's really important because even me, uh, you know, I do this a lot, I do a lot of research, you know, we, we make these mistakes because sometimes it slips our mind and we're writing through the text. But if you want to turn off your reviewer or your editor, like when we see sentences where suddenly you're trying to implicate causation and trying to be too bold in interpreting your data, that's like a red flag, your paper will be immediately rejected. So I would say that's also extremely important in how you write and to state the findings as they are and not overextend yourself in trying to make some a statement about whatever study you did. Uh, many of you may have seen this statement before. Uh, if you torture the data long enough, they will tell you whatever you want to hear. And uh, it's actually really true because, you know, in, in the past, uh, conducting observational studies, retrospective chart review, it was complicated. It was not that simple. You know, paper review, you go over charts, it takes thousands of hours to go over this, and, and then statistical analyses, you need to hire a biostatistician who's paid X dollars per hour, and you, you just do the study and you get the results. But today, anybody can do analyses, right? Uh, if you have a couple of hours of free time, you can download SPSS, run a bunch of analyses, you don't like the results, you cut a variable, add another variable, re reorganize a variable, and then suddenly you find the results you want. But um, you think that you, some people may think that you can get away with that, but it, it, they're, good editors or good reviewers are able to pick up on these signs and, and can figure out if you try to manipulate your data a little bit too much. I'll give you an example. One of the most important things that I look at when I review a paper or when I write a paper is how the court is constructed. Are these consecutive patients? Which patients were excluded? 
Why were they excluded? If you read a paper that I write, I will try to be extremely transparent about each step. I excluded these patients because clinically these patients didn't make sense to be included because so and so. But sometimes people don't, are not that transparent. They'll just say we excluded everybody with a median lobe. We excluded everyone uh, with uh, a prostate beyond X number of grams. Is it justified to do that? Or was it just because you didn't find a result you wanted and therefore you'd excluded those patients and now the, core, the results show what you want? And if you don't, you're not transparent about your process of selecting the patients, uh, the good reviewers are gonna pick up on that and that's when you're gonna get in trouble and you're gonna say, why is my paper rejected? Well, because of things like that. So that is extremely important, to spend the right amount of time to describe how you included and how you excluded patients. Um, the other thing that you should know is, you may have heard of something called Bonferroni correction. Um, if you do multiple comparisons, if you run 17 different analyses on the same cohort, just looking at different endpoints or changing, permutating something, you are bound to find something that is significant. So again, if you are doing this kind of thing, certain statistical corrections need to be made. You cannot just use p-value less than 0.05 and then just because you found one result that that is appropriate. So again, emphasizing that you know, this is the problem with data today. We have access to this data, we can run analyses, we can exclude patients, but if you are not transparent about it, maybe you may get away with it in a bad journal, but in good journals, reviewers, editors will be able to tell that your data has been manipulated too much and that something is fishy with your results. Um, so tips and tricks, you know, how do you get across your message correctly and get your paper published? I think it's really important before you do any analysis to formulate a clear study plan, to say that this is what I intend to do, this is not a fishing expedition, this is the variable I'm interested in, these are the covariates I'm gonna use, and this is the endpoint. You formulate this plan correctly, and then sometimes, obviously, you're gonna have situations where you, oh, I made a mistake, I should not have included those patients. But everything you do has to make sense, and if you have to follow this process rigorously, because otherwise, like I said, it's pretty obvious to reviewers if you did not do that. Um, the other thing I would say is a lot of people are spending a lot of time on the introduction and the discussion, but the reality is like editors are just gonna read your methods and your results, and your discussion should, should speak for itself. Um, you know, you can be poetic in your discussion and start saying all sorts of things and quoting a lot of people, but the reality is that most editors are most interested in the methods and then your results, because I can make up a discussion or my interpretation of the data based on reading your paper, and your discussion should just be more like an like additional information rather than the center of the paper. I would say the most important section of the discussion is not the actual corroboration of other evidence and your implications, but rather when you start about your limitations. Because an honest writer, uh, an honest scientist will understand the limitations of their paper and will be extremely careful to list all of them so that the authors, uh, the reader is not over-interpreting their study and understand uh, where you take them there. So sometimes what's the most disappointing as a reviewer is when you see a paper and they just say how great their findings are and there's no paragraph or dedicated space to talk about what's wrong with their studies. I think that you can avoid a lot of problems by just putting the limitation section, being transparent, and then the reader says, okay, there's a lot of limitations, but at least the authors were honest about it and you know, it will make the paper, they will feel better about uh, getting the paper accepted into their journals. As you know, uh, a lot of you probably have asked me, what's this, all this stuff about advanced statistical methodology? What's propensity score matching? I'm just gonna spend two minutes because a lot of people ask me this question. I added these slides on. Um, the obvious scenario here is you're comparing two treatments. Uh, we're doing a retrospective study of uh, uh, one given institution. And then you look at the curves and you see, well, look, the prostatectomy patients survive longer. The uh, patients who had radiation therapy survive, uh, survive was worse. Prostatectomy is better, right? It's not that simple, right? And that's why we conduct what we call multivariable analyses. And multivariable analyses like uh, Cox regression is one way to do uh, this kind of study. But what is uh, more popular these days is something you may have heard called propensity score adjustment. And I'm gonna just try to explain to you quickly what that is because maybe this is a statistical technique you're gonna wanna do. Um, so the idea of propensity scores is that you have two cohorts that are quite different. Uh, you have a cohort of robotic patients uh, who are, for whatever reason, thinner, healthier, and then you have open surgery patients who are older and sicker. So 
the way propensity scores work is a way to try to balance the two cohorts and attribute scores to say, well, this patient on the open side and this patient on the robotic side are pretty similar, so we're going to give them more uh, weight. Whereas this patient is an outlier, so we're not going to account as much for that patient. And, you know, it's a mathematical model, but ultimately the goal is to have two uh, equivalent cohorts so that it's like a pseudo-randomization. It's obviously statistical, it's not perfect, but it tries to get patients that are completely different. Um, so, for example, the circles in white are basically pre-adjustment, and then by using statistical modeling, uh, the patients look more similar, so the red dots showing that the patients are pretty similar across both cohorts. Um, by doing so, one of the benefits by doing propensity scores is that now it looks more like a randomized trial. So instead of doing these logistic regressions and saying, well, the odds ratio is three, and what does that exactly mean? Now suddenly you balance the two cohorts and you say survival in robotic surgery was 70%, uh, survival in open surgery was 55%, and it's a language that clinicians understand better. And I think that that's probably the major reason why propensity scores are more popular these days in scientific literature, rather than it being a superior statistical technique, because the reality is that many studies have been done, and they show that if you do a Cox regression model or a propensity score model, they're, they're pretty similar statistically. It's just that it sounds better, and it's easier to interpret as a clinician. So this is a good example of a study. This is an actual study that was published in JAMA, I believe. Uh, if you look at the full sample, there's no difference between the two cords. But once you do the, pro but there's a big difference between the two treatment arms. So when they do the propensity score matching, then there's a significant uh, benefit for one group versus the other. So again, the goal is to balance the cohort so that it looks like a randomization, even though we can all agree it's not true randomization. Um, what's also important to understand about propensity scores is that, you know, it doesn't substitute a randomized trial. But if you have a lot of variables, so if you are propensity score matching over all the variables that you can possibly imagine that are relevant to the patient, then your, your propensity scores are valid. Whereas, obviously, if you don't have a lot of variable and you're just propensity score matching a couple variables that are not relevant, then there's no point in doing that, and you're just going to have the same biases that you had before. And therefore, as a reviewer or an editor, that's the kind of thing we're looking for. What did you propensity score for? If you did propensity scores on something that is irrelevant, then obviously it's not going to help the study. So anyways, like I said, this is a potpourri presentations of potential caveats and things that you should be looking for. I hope some of these tips will be useful for you, but if anything, again, I would emphasize, you have so much data now, we can do all sorts of analyses. So you have to be scientifically transparent, come up with a clear study plan, decide a priori what you're going to include in your study, and obviously we make mistakes, we forget things, but all the decisions you make has to be justified. Not you sit in front of a computer, have an Excel sheet, run the analyses, oh, it's not significant, why don't I exclude these guys who are 80 and above, oh, it's still not significant, let's exclude everybody with a median lobe, and then, oh, now it's significant, so, and then you publish that, because obviously that will be pretty obvious to reviewers, and unfortunately that's like the number one reason of rejection. I just go quickly through uh, the study plan. If it doesn't make sense, the paper gets rejected. So hopefully this was of some use to you guys. It's really short. You know, I, this presentation is actually in an hour long, but I cut it down to 15 minutes. I've uh, been happy to take any questions. Thank you.